Hey there, I thought that today we would do some neuroanatomy. So ha let's have a look at the brain stem. When I say brain stem, I say brain stem. I do not say the wrinkly bits of the cortex. I am just talking about brain stem. So what does a brain stem do? Well, it's a lower part of your brain that to a large degree keeps you alive. There's a little bit more to it than that. But up here would be your spinal cord right and that goes into your spine of course and then here we get into some interesting structures that are sort of the entry point into your brain but before we get into all of that I think it would be very interesting to look at the cranial nerves I'm not going to talk about cranial nuclei because that would make this very complicated and you can't really see them on this model I'm just talking about the actual cranial nerves. Cranial nerves, you have 12 of them, there are pairs, so you see one on the left and one on the right, for example, and um, they allow your brain to get input from your sensory organs, uh, for example, from your eyes, I'll get to that, or from your ears, and uh, they also allow your brain to provide output to specific muscles for example or in the case of some of these nerves to say your heart so what do you have well if we start at the bottom here here you would have the accessory nerve and then you get a big one here of course they occur on both sides of the brain but i'm just going to point at one so we have accessory nerve there and then also known spinal accessory nerve <clears throat> and then here you have the vagus nerve Vagere in Latin means to wander, a big nerve that goes all the way down and that innervates your heart, for example. And then here we have the glossopharyngeal nerve, and if you know your ancient languages a bit, um, <laughs> glossopharyngeal refers to both your tongue and your pharynx. But again, I'm not going to go too much into function here. Then we have this nerve here, that's the hypoglossal nerve, hypoglossal, below, below the tongue is what that means. Again, functions of all these things you can look up in any good neuroanatomy text or any text on cognitive neuroscience. Here we have the abducens nerve, and then here things get a little complicated because here you have a little row of three. and. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the back one, the most posterior one, uh, I uh, strongly believe is the vest. It's a little tough, right? Because they're like they're, they're lined up, and it's kind of hard to see which is which, especially because I can't see where they connect. But the the one at the back here that would be the vestibulocochlear nerve, so that innervates the uh, vestibular system, which uh, kind of tells your brain what way your head is oriented, for example, as well as the cochlea, which of course is very important for your hearing, right? The actual uh, structure in your ear that, that allows you, that sort of has the auditory receptors that allows you to collect auditory information. And then you have two branches of the facial nerve. Actually, I think it's nervous intermediates is one branch and you have the facial nerve, but kind of together, we typically consider them to be the facial nerve. Um, then we go up here, here's a big one, the trigeminal nerve. And that is a nerve that really innervates big parts of your face. And very interesting if you uh, experience pain when you're outside and it's very cold, you get this sort of strange headache. Uh, that is done by this guy. The trigeminal nerve does that kind of um, pain. Uh, here, right there, we have the, uh, the, the pair of oculomotor nerves. And as that name suggests, kind of deal with moving your eyes in specific directions. But so does the abducens nerve. So again, let's conveniently ignore functions here. I've got big ones here. Look at that. Those are your optic nerves. So your eyeballs would be about there in space, right? And they, uh, so the ganglion cells in your retina, they, they sort of all their axons collect exit the back of your eyeball through the optic disc or the blind spot and then they they go in here and then here you have the optic chiasm which is where those nerves cross over so that output from your right eye can go to the left and output from your left eye can go to the right okay uh, there is a another cranial nerve because this is number three oculomotor and this is number two um, there's also number four and number four you can't see very well yet because I haven't disassembled all this but if you look down there you see that 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 white line well that is the um, trochlear nerve 
Troplia, kind of fun, that, that means pulley, and that pulls your eye upward, vertical motion of the eye. So it's a troglia, uh, troplear nerve, and the fun thing about the troglear nerve is that that is the only uh, cranial nerve that actually exits from the back, the dorsal part of your brainstem. Now the final, the final cranial nerve we can't see. This would be the top, and uh, somewhere up here, right beneath the cortex, okay, okay, I'll pull it out, right there they are. That would be the first optic nerve, you see them here, the, um, sorry, that's the, the first cranial nerve. This would be the olfactory bulb, and this is the olfactory tract, and that, that, that part here, this, that is the first cranial nerve. Okay, that's enough about nerves. What else do we have? Well, let's start to pull this thing apart. Let's start here. This you may know if you have taken any course where people talk about the brain. This is the corpus callosum. And uh, the corpus callosum allows the left half of the brain to communicate with the right half of the brain and the right half of the brain with the left half of the brain. A little bit more to it than that. So there are some different parts you can distinguish. Uh, there is the, um, the body of the corpus callosum, right? Literally. Corpus callosum means calloused body, but that structure itself has a part called the body. Then you have the part at the front here called the genu, genu of the corpus callosum. So this would be the front part of the brain, right? Uh, genu means knee. That's why we got genuflect. And it's uh, kind of bent like a knee. And then you have the rostrum. Rostrum means the bill, like the bill of a bird. And you kind of see it has that kind of bill-like structure, kind of curved, right? And finally here you have the splenium. Uh, splenium means bandage. Think about it, a rolled up bandage and then kind of one part of the bandage that you pull out and it forms the rest of the corpus callosum. Here you have the septum pellicidum. Septum means fence and pellicidum means transparent or translucent. Uh, thin sheet, a membrane that separates the two lateral ventricles, so that would run right in the middle there, but, but, but I'll get to that. What else can you see? Well, I'm now looking at the top of the corpus callosum, and then you can see a couple of structures if you want to get really, really technical. Uh, not everyone points this out, but here you have the, um, the longitudinal lateral striae, so that would be plural, stria is singular. So lateral longitudinal stria and lateral longitudinal stria, lateral as in towards the side, and in the middle here you have the medial longitudinal stria of the corpus callosum, because why not give it the longest possible name you can. In between that is the inducium griseum, another beautiful term, inducium griseum. That's right there. Okay, so I think that covers the corpus callosum. Okay, so you got that corpus callosum allows the brain halves to communicate. Now what else? What, what can we pull off of this next? Well, let's do this thing. You see where it runs? Right there. Right there. Now what's that? Well, this is kind of limbic, limbic system. And uh, if we take that out, you can see a couple of things. Uh, the limbic system has a little structure known as the hippocampus. Okay, the hippocampus. So this kind of runs, runs the brain like this, and here you've got it, the hippocampus. Okay, which has these nice little folds. Of course, it means seahorse. A little hard to see in a, in a this this specific structure, but if you look at it, if you were kind of like you would you would see how it runs in the brain, it looks like like a seahorse. Um, we've got that the hippocampus. Strictly speaking, we often call this the hippocampal formation because there's a bit more going on. Here you can see that very medial, right? So towards the the middle of the brain. You have this what, what looks green here, and that greenish structure, that is the, um, uh, the dentate gyrus. Dens in Latin, D-E-N-S, means tooth. Dentate gyrus is the tooth gyrus. Remember, gyrus is a, is a ridge in the brain, and you, can, uh, you need a little bit of fantasy for these things, but you can see it looks maybe a little bit like, like, uh, like teeth, right, a row of teeth. Okay, and then, fun fact, because this is how all these things come together, right? Remember those, those stria we were talking about, or striae, we were talking about at the top of the corpus callosum. L look at that, look at that. They connect. 
You have to remember these things in the brain connect. So the dentate gyrus runs up and then forms, splits up, right? And then you get these, these striae. Okay, so that's actually the connection of the dentate gyrus. Okay, then what else do we got? Well, this is a, a lot of structures in the brain in this area are kind of C-shaped, okay? And this is no exception. So what's this? Well, uh, this is the fornix. Fornix means arch. Arch, as in the arch of, a, of a, um, an aqueduct in ancient Rome. So you have that arch here. And then here, the columns of the, the fornix, right? An important output structure for this, this hippocampal formation. Uh, if you were to look at the whole brain stem again, you see that, you see maybe those little, those two little holes down there. So that's where this, this structure connects. And at the bottom here, you see those two, uh, what is that, orangey, pinkish, I don't know how to describe that. These two uh, globular things, those are the mammillary bodies involved in memory somehow. Okay, somehow, something to do with memory. And uh, those things as you can see, are connected to the, uh, the, uh, the, the columns of the fornix. So that's, again, how everything comes together. I'm just pulling that part of the brain off again. Let's see what else we have. What can we see? Well, let's, let's pull off this piece. Here you have the cerebellum. Now, I want to talk about the brain stem, and this is the cerebellum, so let's not talk too much about this. Uh, what can you see? Uh, well, uh, this is the top, and this is the bottom part. All these, these different lumps and bumps have different names, but um, let's look at the bottom here. You have this big uh, structure that's called the tonsilla. And if that sounds like tonsil, well, that's the same word, okay? Tonsilla, but obviously not the tonsils from your throat, right? There's a different part of your body. Tonsilla here, tonsilla there, and then here you have the flocculus. These things have different functions too, but again, I'm not really talking about functions that much. The uh, flocculus, flocculus is a diminutive term, means a little ball of wool. A little ball of wool, and that's kind of what it looks like. And then here you have uh, the, uh, the, 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 the vermis. Vermis means worm, and that runs, kind of runs up. Um, the sort of in between the, the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. Fun fact, the whole cerebellum has more neurons than the entire cortex has together, so that's very interesting. If you open this up, you get a very poetically named structure. So here, the center of the cerebellum, we call this the arbor vitae. That's not a term you see every day, some people don't use it, but I like it. Arbor vitae, the tree of life has nothing to do with the function. This does not control your respiration or something. It's just like a tree. Okay, and then here, the cerebellar, not, this, um, uh, not the cerebral, the cerebellar peduncle. There also is a cerebral peduncle, but the cerebellar peduncle connects the... Uh, I'm just putting them together, connects the cerebellum to the brainstem, okay? Now let's, that, let's, let's, that, that's, that's down there somewhere now, and uh, that's okay. So there you have that, that part of the, the cerebellum. What else, what else do we have? Well, <laughs> there's a lot to see. Um, the superior medullary velum, and then, I have to pick it up now. So if you look at the, the bottom part, of the um, uh, cerebellar peduncle, that would actually be the inferior medullary velum, and together, the superior inferior medullary uh, velums, they, they actually form the base, the outline of the fourth ventricle. I'll get to the ventricles later. What else can you see here? Well, this was that trochlear nerve, remember? The one cranial nerve coming out of the back of the um, the brain stem, and then here you have another fantastic term, one of my favorites, the corpora quadrigemina, the quadruplet bodies. The superior and the inferior colliculi, important for vision and hearing, respectively, uh, quickly orienting your eyes, fast eye movements, and quickly orienting uh, your, your head to a loud sound, for example. That's what the inferior colliculi do, so we think. And those things have um, brachia as well, so a brachium means it's sort of like a branch. So you have a branch for the inferior and a branch for the superior 
um, collicula. What is this thing, this strange thing? Looks like it's two structures, but make no mistake, it's one, one thing. Okay, that's the pineal gland, and the pineal gland is where Descartes thought that the soul and the body interact. In reality, it just produces melatonin, so it's not as fantastic as Descartes made it seem, but an important little gland. We'll talk about this bit later when I open up the whole structure. What else do we have? Well, let's start to pull apart some things. Oh, you know what's really cool? This thing here. So the hippocampus would be right below it, right? And then this big thing there, that's the amygdaloid complex. We often call that the amygdala, but that's not really true because it's a whole set of nuclei, so amygdaloid, amygdaloid complex is a little bit more accurate. Oh, and then I, I guess I should have gone over these really big structures, but they're, they're now so obvious to me I don't even think about it. So here we have the medulla oblongata, for short, medulla, which medulla oblongata means extended marrow. So this is where the spinal cord basically turns into brain, right? Extended marrow, easy to remember. Here you have the pyramids, and here you have the decussations of the pyramids. So decussation means that fiber bundles cross over from left to right and from right to left. This little thing is the olive. Okay, the olive, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, important for, for example, uh, auditory localization. Where does the sound come from? And here you have a big structure called the pons. Pons means bridge. Bridge because it is kind of like a bridge. It bridges uh, uh, different parts of the brain, like the cerebellum, right, which goes at the back here. Um, the cerebellum and the rest of the brainstem, for example. Pons. Okay. Okay, anything else I should say about that? Uh, where you can sort of see the connections running left to right and right to left again. And then here, can you see that? That is the cerebral peduncle. So the cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum kind of to this part of the brain. And the cerebral peduncle connects the pons to the uh, cerebrum, to the actual cortical bit that looks folded like this. Okay, what do we have here? This is uh, insula used to be known as the insula of Reil, R-E-I-L, but is now just called insula. And the insula is quite deep. Now, again, I guess I should pull this out. Okay, brain, cerebellum again, eyeball would be about, about there, right? Now, if I pull off this part, there you go, now you see where we are, okay? Uh, longitudinal, lateral, stria, and here is that insula. Very hard to depict that in a two-dimensional picture. Much easier when you fondle a model. Insula. If I pull that out, what do you get? Now you get something that looks like candy, but it's unfortunately not that sweet. Not that I've tried, obviously. This thing is actually two nuclei. Here we have the internal capsule. There is also an external capsule, and then there is an extreme capsule, and that dude is like, oh my god, so extreme. But this is the internal capsule, and the internal capsule houses this thing, and this thing is called the nucleus lentiformis, the lens-shaped nucleus. It doesn't actually have a little pin to connect there, that's not how the brain works, but the uh, lentiform nucleus uh, has two parts. On the lateral side, so towards the outside of the brain, towards the side, it is the putamen. But on the inside, the medial side of the brain, you see that's another uh, nucleus, you have the globus pallidus, the pale globe. Yeah, pale globe. So, putamen, lateral, globus pallidus, medial. And in just a second, I'm going to show you something else. Let me pull this off. What do we have here? Well, uh, here you can see a vein. Now, I always have to look up the vasculature of the brain. I think this is the thalamostriate vein. But maybe don't take my word for that one, because I'm not very good at the vasculature of the brain. Okay, so we have the internal capsule, we have the lentiform nucleus, uh, and now we're kind of getting to thalamus. But let's, let's not... Let's not rush. What do we have on the other side? Because this model is not entirely symmetrical. They did that really nicely. Insula. The amygdaloid complex. Interesting structure here. What's going on there? 
These are fiber bundles that allow um, parts of the brain to communicate with other parts of the brain. So look, look, look at this, look at how cool this is. So now you have a somewhat different view of structures here. So what, what, what's going on here? Well, this central part you've already seen. That's the nucleus lentiformis, there you go, right? With the putamen and the globus pallidus. So this would be the putamen part. And then here, you have another fantastic structure, okay, part of your, your limbic system, um, or the, I should probably, no, let's, let's, let's say, well, yeah, basal ganglia depends on what you count among that, but here we have the caudate nucleus, and I'm, I'm pointing at this because caudate nucleus just means tailed nucleus, here you have the tail of the caudate nucleus, and here you have the corpus, the body of the caudate nucleus. And that kind of runs around the putamen. And these little structures, you see that? These those, those are fiber bundles that allow the caudate nucleus to talk to the putamen. Okay, if I pull that thing off, and you see it again, right, just like before, putamen on the lateral side and globus pallidus on the medial side. And here we have, um, again, fiber bundles that allow different parts of your brain to communicate. Okay, uh, is there anything else that I missed here? I think we are doing pretty well. So uh, let's, let's snap this thing open. Beautiful here, now that things are a bit cleared up, right? You can really see how those optic nerves decussate. So you have an eye here and you have an eye there on the left and on the right. Optic nerve comes in, decussates, crosses over, and 90% of the optic nerve goes down there. And down there, that would be the um, lateral geniculate nucleus, that is part uh, of the, um, uh, the hypo, sorry, part of the thalamus, thalamus, not hypo, but thalamus, sorry. And that is the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, and then there also is, more towards the middle, a medial geniculate nucleus, another part of the thalamus. And here you again see that uh, cerebral peduncle and the mammillary bodies and the oculomotor nerve, all things we've already talked about. Okay, so, colliculi, corpora quadrigemina, like we talked about, and the uh, pineal gland. What else? Now, let's try to tease this thing apart, it's always a little difficult. Remember, optic nerve, a nerve is what you call a bundle of, well, let's say axons uh, in the um, peripheral nervous system, and once you hit the central nervous system, a bundle like that becomes a tract. So this is still optic nerve, but after the optic chiasm, where input crosses over, and yes, some input from the right stays on the right, Right? But a lot of the input crosses over, and once it crosses over, you're kind of looking at... Now you're talking about the central nervous system, and in the central nervous system, a fiber bundle like that is called a tract. So then the optic nerve turns into the optic tract. Okay, enough about that. What else do we got? Now you're looking at the inside of the brain stem. And there's a lot to see in the inside of the brain stem, isn't there? So what do we got? Well, here you have medulla oblongata. Here you have pons, but now the inside. We've already talked about that. Here you have the tectum, which means roof. And the tectum has a couple of structures, but two that we already talked about are the superior and inferior colliculi. Right? And then here you have the tegmentum, and tegmentum means floor. And this structure kind of... Uh, yeah, it forms the floor of this part that we call the diencephalon. And the diencephalon consists, for all intents and purposes, as far as I'm concerned, of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a sec. What else do we have here? Um, well, you may notice there's a little tunnel there. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, that tunnel is, is, allows your cerebrospinal fluid to flow from the third to the fourth ventricles. Okay? Um, cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. Sylvius. Okay. I'll get to the... You know what? We're on it now. Here you have 
your entire beautiful ventricular system. Ventricles are cavities in the brain. You cannot model a cavity, but you can model what's inside. This is a cast from a real brain. Okay, so this is the liquid that would be in those ventricles. Now what do you get? Well, this thing that looks like the head from that thing in Alien, uh, that's the lateral ventricle with the uh, anterior horn, the, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, sorry, the, so um, the anterior horn, the posterior horn, and then the lateral horn, which is towards the side. I'll try to rotate a bit so you get a three-dimensional view of this. So again, this is the, that cerebrospinal fluid. Now, that cerebrospinal fluid can flow from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, which is this thing you see here. Let me I put my hand behind it because the, it's not very clear with a white background, I think. The third ventricle. Well, there's a lot to say about the third ventricle. First of all, the uh, foramen of Monroe foramen is just Latin for whole, but uh, that's that would be about here, and that allows liquid to flow from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. And as it, you can see the very specific shape here. Well, this is the outline of the hypothalamus, and this is kind of the outline of the thalamus, because the third ventricle is right between those two thalami, right? You see that here. So you've put that together right in between those two things, that's the third ventricle. Then uh, you have a strange hole here. What's that for? Well, that strange hole is uh, that, that, that's liquid flowing around the interthalamic adhesion, which runs there. That's that orange bit you see there. Allows the two thalami to communicate, so we think. Um, thalamus on one side, thalamus on the other side, and in between the interthalamic adhesion. There we go. And then, as I said, hypothalamus. Okay. Cerebral aqueduct, aqueduct of Sylvius. Cerebrospinal fluid flows down. How does it flow? Uh, tough story uh, to, to, to put in a nutshell, but uh, ependymal cells, special glia cells with little sort of hairs that, that move around uh, in the choroid plexi, and they kind of make that cerebrospinal fluid move. And then here you have this big thing, well that would be the fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle. Okay, and then here uh, you actually have a duct that allows the cerebrospinal fluid to flow uh, into the spinal cord. This would be the center of the spinal cord. That would be around this, right? And of course, it also flows outside because the whole brain and uh, spinal cord are bathed in that fluid to kind of cushion it a bit. And then at the bottom, what you see uh, is the uh, cere uh, cerebellomedullary cistern. Uh, it's kind of a space where uh, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, kind of collects. That used to be called the cisterna magna, if I'm not mistaken. A big cistern, right? Okay, finally, what else can we see uh, in these brain stems, well, there's a couple of things. So this, this was the uh, the pineal gland. We talked about that. Now, if you know your anatomy a little bit, you would probably be tempted to say, "Oh, this must be the fornix. This must be the fornix." Yeah, no, 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 no. Because we've already talked about the fornix. Remember, this was the fornix. So the fornix runs there. You know, this is another structure. Um, and um, um, we call that the, um, I'm really struggling to find the name right now, the hypothalamic. No, I have to come back to that one. It's eluding me right now. Let's, let's just continue, continue, pretend that nothing happened. Okay, nothing happened. So what else do we have? Uh, let me prop this up with the lentiform nucleus. Well, that's the interthalamic adhesion, right? Now, when we teach the brain, we often say the, uh, the corpus callosum allows both, both halves of the brain to communicate. Well, that, that's absolutely true, but there are some other parts of the brain that kind of go from left to right and right to left. And here you have one of those things, the anterior commissure. The anterior commissure. Interesting. And then at the back, you have the posterior commissure. The posterior commissure. And they allow the left and right sides of the brain to communicate as well. And then there's actually a, a third commissure, the habenula, or the habenular commissure. Uh, it's not really indicated very clearly on this brain, but, but, oh sorry, on this model, but that would be about there. Okay, so if you look at it, a median slice through the middle here, about there, 
habenular commissure. Okay. Yeah, and this structure, I'm going to have to put that in the description because I forget. Um, it's a, um, yeah, it's, it's part of the, uh, the, the thalamus. Okay. More thalamus, right? Uh, we've already talked about the uh, medial geniculate nucleus and the lateral geniculate nucleus and another term uh, you you see uh, often is this kind of this 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 structure here uh, sort of another lumpy bumpy bit the pulvinar pulvinar thalami part of the um, uh, thalamus yeah the, the thalami too are kind of a bunch of nuclei so it's a lot of different nuclei okay um, Anything else I missed? Well, you can see how the cerebrospinal fluid would flow here, right? Beautifully indicated. And then you have the lateral ventricle that would be there. The third ventricle would be here. And I think that's the final thing we should talk about, this hypothalamus. Okay, what, do we, what can we say about the hypothalamus? Well, an important hormonal center. And um, if you look at this tiny bit here, it's a small bit, I know, right there. That would be the infundibulum. The infundibulum is the pituitary stalk, and that means that the, the hypophysis, the pituitary gland, that's about here. But you can't see that. Why is there no pituitary? What happened to my pituitary? Unfortunately, when you do a dissection, uh, there is a little cavity in the skull here. The, in this sphenoid bone of the skull, to be precise, and that houses the pituitary gland. But unfortunately, that's kind of, as I said, it's kind of like, as I try to indicate, kind of U-shaped, right? So it kind of envelops that pituitary gland. And uh, unfortunately, when you dissect uh, a cadaver, you, you, you sort of pull out the brain. Often the pituitary gets pulled off because it's kind of stuck in that, that cavity in the sphenoid bone. So it doesn't really work so well. Unfortunate. But that would be the infundibulum, the pituitary stalk leading to the anterior and the posterior part of the um, pituitary gland, right? And then you have the, uh, uh, it's kind of like a, like a bump here. Clearly that, that thing is, is hollow, it's, it's a stalk. Um, but here you would have the tuberous cinereum, a bumpy bit, but you, you can't see that very well in this model. The uh, ashen root, because of its color. Yeah, the tuba cinerium. So there is that. Anything else? Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, supra optic recess. Uh, that's this part, uh, also known as the optic recess. Um, the hypothalamic sulcus. Uh, that's a groove kind of between the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Beyond that, I think that would really cover it for basic anatomy. And that's pretty much it. So, I hope this was useful. I tried to stick to half an hour. It's 33 minutes, so I think that's not terrible. I hope this was useful. I hope you found this helpful. Here's two things I want to point out. For sure, I have mislabeled something. Uh, that, that almost invariably happens. You can only learn neuroanatomy by putting in the hours. You, you, you have to. You, and, and cramming this the night before the test means you will not learn. You really have to put in the hours to learn the names of all these structures. I hope I have done well. I've done as well as I could. Uh, that takes time. Um, the second thing is you cannot learn neuroanatomy from two-dimensional pictures. You need to touch real brains, which is often a bit difficult for obvious reasons. If not, see if you can get your, holes on, your hands on a model like this. These models are quite expensive, but they really allow you to see things three-dimensionally, and this is a very good model, so you can really see what it looks like in life size on a real brain. Okay, hope this was useful. If you have any questions, and if you point, want to point out errors, then by all means do so. Do it in the comments below. Hope this was useful, and I'll gladly see you later. Bye-bye.